Have you ever wondered where you really stand with God? Are you overcome with feelings of guilt because of things you've done wrong? Are you tired of religion that focuses on rules that you can't keep? Have we got good news for you? It's time to listen in on some casual conversation with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski and discover what true freedom is all about. This is Growing in Grace. Hey, I'm Mike, along with Joel, for another week of Growing in Grace, the podcast found at growingingrace.org. Thank you for sharing it with a friend. Hope you're doing okay this week, Joel. We, um, we're we in the process of getting ready to jump into the subject of confessing sins in order to be forgiven. Is this something that's, that's really necessary for, for many of us, especially in evangelical cir- circles, but also outside of evangelical Christianity? Confessing of sin can be a, a big part of the religious business. Is it something that's needed or is it something that we're is it something that we've been misled on? And so that's something we'll be talking about. Now listen, if if you haven't caught last week's podcast yet, it would be a decent idea for you to go back and catch some of the scriptures that we shared on last week's podcast because we just went through a handful or so different scriptures that were written by the apostles in the New Testament declaring and proclaiming that forgiveness is something that has already occurred, something that has already happened. It's not something that's offered over and over again, but it came through the finished work of Jesus Christ and his shed blood. So I encourage you to go back and see those scriptures because this whole confession thing, it basically revolves around one verse in the entire Bible found in 1 John 1, 9. So we're going to try to provide some context. I'm not even sure we'll get to the actual verse of 1 John 1, 9 this week, but we're going to provide some context of the things John said in the eight verses leading up to 1 John 1, 9. So Joel, I, and I was looking um, in the book of Acts, Peter was speaking to some people and he said to him, all the prophets bear witness. So he's, he's referring back to the old covenant prophets who were looking ahead to this thing that we're under now in the new covenant. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him, Jesus, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now that's a verse that's easy to skip over, but think about the magnitude of it. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So the question we have to ask is, which is it? Is it forgiveness by believing in the work of Jesus? Or is it the conditional requirement of repeated confessions of sin? So those are some things to think about. I think there was another verse we didn't get to uh, last week too. It wasn't really a verse, but I just want to bring up a point. Acts chapter 16. Remember when uh, Paul and his gang escaped from prison? Supernaturally, the doors came open. The Philippian jailer came over to him and fell down and said, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say, ask God for forgiveness. He didn't even say to confess your sins or any of that. He just said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And that word saved, it means to to save, to heal, preserve, and rescue. That word rescue can literally mean to deliver out of danger and into safety. God rescued us from the penalty and the power of sin. He's our provision. He's our safety. He's our refuge. Mm-hmm. And you know, uh, another thing to bring up along with that and you know, all the writings of Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul, he, he's the one who gave us, you know, two-thirds of the New Testament. He, he gave us the gospel. He told us in several different epistles what the gospel is, how to be saved, you know, how to be forgiven, how to get this new life. And not once did Paul ever tell the people to confess their sins, and then God would forgive them. He dealt with a lot of sinful behavior in the church. Think about the Corinthians and the various things that they were doing that he wrote to them about. He gave them instructions. He gave them uh, wisdom on how to handle certain things that were going on. And not once did he say that they needed to confess their sins in order to be forgiven. You see, they were already forgiven. The church is already forgiven. We're already forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. That one sacrifice of Jesus Christ provided us with forgiveness for all sin for all time, as we talked about a few weeks ago. All sin for all time was taken care of. Paul simply gave the church some instructions again and some wisdom on, on how to, what to do. You know, uh, don't glory. 
in sinful behavior. Don't glory in that stuff. He talked about some things to do, but he never said, confess your sins in order to be forgiven, because Paul knew that it was through that one sacrifice. You know, if you read the book of Romans, not once does he mention confession of sin. He mentions the one confession of Jesus Christ. Confess Jesus. If you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He didn't say, now, keep on confessing your sins over and over again. Whenever you sin, make sure you confess your sins, because he knew that they had already been forgiven. And so that's, uh, I think, something important to remember, that the Apostle Paul never gave us that instruction. And like you said, we'll get into 1 John 1, 9, and, and we'll see uh, whether it's this week or next week. We'll, we'll see where we go with that. Yeah. I mean, you stop and think about it. Think of all the things we've been talking about in recent weeks, even last week. So as believers in Christ, because you made a great point, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, never once, think about that, never once, not one time did he say, confess your sins, ever. In fact, you won't even find the phrase, ask God for forgiveness, anywhere, really, in the Bible. But you see, because religion kind of has this, uh, I should say empty religion, <laughs> has this thing where they, they say that God, they, they, they make it sound like it's good news, but they say that God will forgive you no matter how many times you ask him. But we've got better news than that, because, because the Bible doesn't say to ask God for forgiveness, since the forgiveness was based upon the blood that's already been shed. So that's the good news, is that you don't have to confess in order to be cleansed from unrighteousness, as we covered some of that scripture last week. So the question we should be asking is, as believers in Christ, why would we want to continue seeking forgiveness that has already been provided by confessing sins under a better covenant where God says he remembers them no more, he no longer counts them against us, and he isn't dealing with us according to our sins? So, Joel, sometimes I think we just have to we have to start getting away from traditional doctrine on, on how we've been taught and, and have these reflex reactions all the time and just stop, take a breath and think about these things. And let's start getting honest with ourselves. Let's get honest with ourselves, because when God says he doesn't remember sins anymore, that he's not counting them against us and he isn't dealing with us according to our sins, <laughs> then what are we supposed to do? Go to God and say, hey, God, I'm here to remind you of my sins, and I'm asking you to forgive me again. So you're reminding God of something he said he would remember no more. It doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, the, the math doesn't, it doesn't add up. And so um, that's some of the stuff we'll be addressing, but specifically we're going we're gonna to walk through uh, 1 John chapter 1 here. And, and I think maybe to lay some groundwork here, because I've, I've got the feeling we're we're probably getting close to running out of time here pretty soon. Yeah, and a I don't few know, more minutes left, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if we want to get started here and, and uh, get too far into it because there, there's there's context. It's easy to pull a verse out and, and make an island out of it, but there's context that leads up to this and after it in this in this one verse of 1 John 1, 9. But I think just to lay some groundwork that it's often assumed that um, when the writers of the New Testament are, are, are writing that they're always speaking to Christians and believers, and frequently that's true. But here we've got something a bit unusual and something that we'll be tapping into here in the next couple of weeks is that uh, I want you to jump into 1 John 1 with us and look at it from the perspective of John writing to people who had not yet discovered the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, they may have been embedded in a church-type community with other believers, and that probably would have been more frequent then, even more than it is now, which is also frequent, because this this was a, a new thing starting up, and it was changing the culture. But, Joel, I'll let you kick in here. Yeah, I just uh, hitting on something that you said. I mean, if God has already forgiven and forgotten our sins. It's kind of like, yeah, going up to God and saying, I, I know that you've forgotten my sins, but I, but I just want to remind you. I mean, it's just, it's just silly, uh, because yeah. it was the, the, the blood of bulls and goats, the, the Hebrew says, that reminded them of their sins. Uh, we've got something much better. We got the blood of Jesus that took away our sin, and through which God remembers our sins no more. And so we, we've really got to keep that in mind. And before we get into First John, I'm going to actually jump into uh, for, uh, first. Before we get into First John one, let's. I'm going to look at something in First John two, 
you know, because, you know, we, we, we rip out of context, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, in 1 John 2, verse 12, John writes, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Well, how does he know, if he's writing a letter to them and he hasn't been there with them, how does he know that they've confessed their sins? <laughs> he doesn't know that they've confessed their sins because it really doesn't matter. He, he's right at, at, By that point in the epistle, he's writing, uh, he's addressing believers. But like you said, as the epistle starts out, and, and we'll definitely we'll get into that next week. But laying as in the last couple of minutes here, laying some groundwork here. When you read different parts of the Bible, it's always important to keep in mind certain things like to whom are the words spoken or, or written, who are they directed towards, and what covenants being represented. What's the overall point being made? You've always got to look at context, look at surrounding sentences, the entire book as a whole, find out what's really going on there. John is addressing two different groups of people in this epistle. Even though it doesn't, he, he doesn't say it outright, we can understand just by looking at some of the things that he says that he's writing to two different groups of people. But like you said, Cap, they're all within the same church. There's a group of people who have not yet believed. They're in the church, and they're among the people. They're among the people that gather together as the church, but there's kind of this false doctrine going around that says that sin really wasn't an issue, and so we'll get into that next week. About a minute or or so left, Cap, and maybe we can wrap it up and maybe set up next week. Yeah, what we'll, what we'll find out next week in, in 1 John chapter 1 is that the people he's speaking to kind of have a different view where, where Paul or John doesn't have a fellowship with them that he's that he's hoping to have. Um, their joy is not complete yet with that that bond of fellowship. And so he's making a case to those people. And uh, it looks like the publishers did a pretty good job of, of changing the chapter at the end of verse 10, because you can see the language begins to change in chapter two right away when he begins addressing um, his disciples, um, his students. Uh, his uh, often referred to as children. It's it's a, an affectionate term used as 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 you would with a disciple, and so uh, we're going to get into all of that. But you know, John is going to make the point in in his in the first chapter of of his epistle. He's going to make the point that Jesus Christ really did come in the flesh. We saw him. We touched him. We heard him. And he's speaking to people who didn't believe that. Um, And so we'll get more into that next week. Sounds good. Let's do it. Next week on Growing in Grace, uh, talking about these unbelievers who were in the church who needed to believe, who needed to confess that there was such a thing as sin and that it was a problem. Uh, That's what we'll be talking about next week. First John, uh, the first chapter. Uh, including verse 9, of course, so stay tuned for that next week right here on Growing in Grace. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski, heard online through various Internet sources around the world each week. To access hundreds of past programs, visit graceroots.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.